welcome to God's House for Worship. Uh, my name is Pastor John Seifert, uh, actually Pastor Emeritus. I'm retired now. I'm filling in for Pastor Steinke. As you know, he's gone to uh, uh, graduation reception, uh, celebration, anniversary. We'll follow the order of worship as it's printed for you. Uh, and we'll hear today about God's power. We often confess it, that we believe in it. In the Apostles' Creed, we say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And God certainly does display his almighty power with what he does as far as acts of power, creation. But the scripture readings for today point out both ways that God shows his power. Not just in physical acts that we may see and sense, but also using that power to save us, to forgive our sins, and to finally take us home to heaven. We'll follow the order of worship as it's printed and begin with the singing of our first hymn, hymn number 520, Your Hand, O Lord, in Days of Old. God bless your worship. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. We have come into the presence of God who created us to love and serve him as his dear children, but we have disobeyed him and deserve only his wrath and punishment. Therefore, let us confess our sins to him and plead for his mercy. Merciful Father in heaven, I am altogether sinful from birth. In countless ways I have sinned against you and do not deserve to be called your child. But trusting in Jesus my Savior, I pray, have mercy on me according to your unfailing love. 
cleanse me from my sin and take away my guilt. God, our Heavenly Father, has forgiven all your sins. By the perfect life and innocent death of our Lord Jesus Christ, he has removed your guilt forever. You are his own dear child. May God give you strength to live according to his will. In the peace of forgiveness, let us praise the Lord. O God, you reveal your mighty power chiefly in showing mercy and kindness. Grant us the full measure of your grace, that we may obtain your promises and become partakers of your heavenly glory, through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Testament reading for this 15th Sunday after Pentecost is recorded in the book of the prophet Isaiah, chapter 35, beginning with verse 4. The Lord addresses something that is a part of our lives, fear, and tells us, don't be afraid. Tell those who have a fearful heart, be strong, do not be afraid. Look, the Lord, your God, will come with a vengeance. With God's own retribution, he will come and save you. Then the eyes of the blind will be opened, and the ears of the deaf will be unplugged. The crippled will leap like a deer, and the tongue of the mute will sing for joy. Waters will flow in the wilderness, and streams in the wasteland. The burning sand will become a pool, and in the thirsty ground there will be springs of water. This is the word of the Lord. We respond with the words of the Psalm of the Day, Psalm 146.
second lesson is recorded in the book of the Acts of the Apostles, chapter 3. The Lord displays some of his mighty power through the apostles. Peter and John were going up to the temple at the ninth hour, the hour of prayer. A certain man who was lame from birth was carried there every day and placed at the temple gate, which is called Beautiful, so that he could beg for donations from those entering the temple. When he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked them for a donation. Peter looked directly at him, as did John. Peter said, look at us. So the man paid close attention to them, expecting to receive something from them. But Peter said, silver and gold I do not have. But what I have, I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Peter took him by the right hand and raised him up. And immediately the man's feet and ankles were made strong. Jumping up, he stood and began to walk. He entered the temple courts with them, walking, jumping, and praising God. All the people saw him walking and praising God. They recognized him as the one who used to sit begging for money at the beautiful gate of the temple. And they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. This is the word of the Lord. Hallelujah. Look, here is our God. We waited for him and he saved us. This is the Lord. We waited for him. Let us be glad and rejoice in his salvation. Hallelujah. stand for the reading of the gospel. Gospel according to St. Mark chapter 7. Jesus displays his almighty power. Jesus left the region of Tyre again and went through Sidon to the Sea of Galilee within the region of the Decapolis. They brought a man to him who was deaf and had a speech impediment. They pleaded with Jesus to place his hand on him. Jesus took him aside in private, away from the crowd. He put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. After he looked up to heaven, he sighed and said, Ephatha, which means be open. Immediately the man's ears were opened, his tongue was set free, and he began to speak plainly. Jesus gave the people strict orders to tell no one. But the more he did so, the more they kept proclaiming it. They were amazed beyond measure and said, He has done everything well. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. This is the gospel of the Lord. Please be seated for our next hymn. 385, Chief of Sinners, Though I Be.
Grace and peace to you from God our Father, and from the Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, according to the will of our God and Father, to rescue us from this present evil age. The part of God's word which serves as the basis for the sermon comes from St. Paul's letter to the Christians at Rome, starting with verse 21 of chapter 3. But now, completely apart from the law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference, because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly declared as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. God did this to demonstrate his justice since in his divine restraint he had left the sins that were committed earlier unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that he would be both just and the one who justifies the person who has faith in Jesus. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No, but by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. This is the word of the Lord. Your fellow forgiven sinners. Before I retired, one of the church secretaries at Good Shepherd, Virginia, received a phone call as we were getting near the end of the week. The person was interested in coming to church, so it's the kind of phone call that you like to receive. But first, the caller had a question. The question was, is this the church that ha is having the comedians on Sunday? Well, Virginia said, no, we're not. We didn't have that person come and visit. We weren't going to have comedians that Sunday. Actually, we never have. But let's pretend for just a minute that you came here today because you were fully expecting that you were going to hear a comedian make a presentation. And let's pretend that the jokes that you heard were so hysterically funny that by the time you left, you were exhausted from laughing, your sides hurt, you had tears streaming down your face, and you said, I've never had a service that was that funny before. And then you went out into the rest of the week. And what would you do then? What would you do when you got into the rest of the week? And it was like all the other weeks of your life. Weeks in which you faced some of the heartbreaking problems that are part of life because of your own sin. Some of the heartbreaking problems that are part of life because of the sins that others commit against you. What would you do if you faced a sudden illness or someone you loved suddenly died or you learned that you would have to have a very serious surgery? What would you think about if, as you went out into that week, you were confronted with difficulties in life, like not really having suitable work for the gifts that God has given to you, maybe wondering what it was you were going to do as far as your retirement, just the normal, everyday worries and problems of life. What would you think about? Would you say, oh, but I really heard some real funny stories when I was in church last week. I remember laughing real hard. I don't think so. 
what you would probably think about is your own sin. What you would probably think about is the sin of other people against you. Because you know that all of the problems, all of the sicknesses, all of the evil and ill things that exist in this life on this side of eternity all ultimately are the result of sin. And some of those things are the result of your own sin. Some of them are the result of those who sin against you. And being able to remember a real funny story about two golfers is not really any solution for the problem of sin. Sin needs to be addressed. And God does that. God addresses with sins like these words that he had the Apostle Paul write and that he's preserved for us. And in those words of God, God tells us, God tells you what it is that he has done because of sin. Not just the sins of others, but what he has done because of your own sin. God has declared you, he says, not guilty. God has declared you not guilty because of his grace because of Jesus' sacrifice, because he is just and the one who justifies the wicked. Sin is something that has been causing problems ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. They brought by their sin, they brought into the world not only sin that they passed on to others, what we call inherited sin, but all of the problems that come as a result of it. And anyone with a passing knowledge of God's word knows that he's a sinner. Everyone, maybe except for those who are the most hardened and most calloused people, has a knowledge of his own sin because he has a conscience that bears witness to God's law that's written in his heart. And where there is sin, there is problems. Sin always causes problems. Maybe one of the bigger problems is that sinful people, because they are so twisted and perverted in their ways of thinking, Sinful people actually think that by themselves they can do something to undo the damage of sin, maybe by trying to counterbalance it with good things that they do. But even the best of those good things is never perfect, and we can't outweigh our sin by imperfect acts of obedience to what it is that God says in his law it certainly doesn't do any good to render some kind of obedience to laws that people just make up in their own minds as things that will please God. Sinners by themselves can do nothing to undo sin or the damage it causes. But we've been singing and hearing about the fact that God is almighty today. And it's with that power that is his, it's with that grace, that undeserved love that is his, that he does something about sin. And he describes it in these words. But now, completely apart from law, a righteousness from God has been made known. The law and the prophets testify to it. This righteousness from God comes through faith in Jesus Christ to all and over all who believe. In fact, there is no difference because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In the Bible, here God has Paul call it the law and the prophets. God has made known, he reveals a righteousness, a sinlessness, a moral perfection that comes from him to sinners. 
And when God talks about this, he says it's something that comes from him to all who have sinned, to all who fall short of the glory of God. And then God uses a wonderful courtroom term to describe what it is that he accomplishes. He says that sinners are justified. It means they are declared not guilty. A little bit of a puzzlement, isn't it? Sinners are guilty. They have done what God forbids. They have failed to do what it is that God commands. And because they are guilty, they do deserve punishment, not just some of them, not just the really bad ones, but all sinners, not just the people out there, but you and me. We've sinned. We're guilty. How then can God say he has declared them not guilty. Well, God declares you not guilty because of his grace. Because he loves you. And he doesn't love you because you're you and you're something really special. He loves you just because he loves you. So he justifies you. Declares you not guilty. Doesn't that make you want to say, well, that's not fair. It's not fair that someone who is guilty should be declared not guilty. And then we remember what it was that happened in the Garden of Eden before Adam and Eve sinned. The Lord told them that if they sinned, that they would die, and they would die because they would be guilty of sin. God had his prophet Ezekiel announce, the soul who sins is the one who will die. He has King David write for us, you hate all who do wrong. God had a whole system of Old Testament sacrifices that pointed out the wages of sin is death, as Paul also summarized in his letter to the Romans, and that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. You remember that whole system of Old Testament sacrifices? There was always a procedure that was involved. You sinned. You brought your sacrifice to the Lord's altar. And then this process took place. First of all, it was an offering that there was nothing wrong with, no blemish or no spot. And then you laid your hand. My sins transferred to that animal. And then you took your knife and you slit your little lamb's throat. And he bled. And he bled. And he died. It was the blood of that sacrifice that was required that suffering and death. And it was a picture of what was coming in the Savior that God had promised. Paul talks about that when he uses these words. There is no difference because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God publicly displayed as the atonement seat through faith in his blood. So you need to remember not only those Old Testament sacrifices, but particularly what happened on that day, one day out of the year in Old Testament times that was called the Day of Atonement, the Great Day of Atonement. 
There was also shedding of blood then, but then something special happened. There was in that most holy place, this cube, 30 feet by 30 feet by 30 feet, the Ark of the Covenant. And in that Ark of the Covenant, there were the Ten Commandments, the law of God that God's people broke. The top of it was sometimes called the mercy seat or the atonement seat it's called here. It was made out of pure gold. Two cherubim on either side. The Lord would display his presence over that seat. And on the great day of atonement, the blood of the sacrifice was carried into the most holy place and the high priest would throw it on top of that mercy seat. Atonement seat that covered Yom Kippur, it says on our English calendars, day of covering, that literally means. And what would happen? The Lord would look down and not look through that atonement cover and see the law which his people broke. He'd see the blood of the covenant that sanctified them. All of that pointing ahead to what it is that Jesus would do when he came as the Savior. His blood has covered your sins. God cannot see them anymore. So what is he going to say about you? Well, he's going to say, you're not guilty because Jesus was your substitute, just like that lamb in Old Testament times. Your sins placed on Jesus. Jesus suffers for them. Jesus bleeds because of them, and Jesus dies. And all of Jesus' holiness, all of Jesus' righteousness, just like that innocent lamb, God says all of that comes back to you. It's yours. It's God's gift to you. It's free. It's all because of his love and because of Jesus' sacrifice. And that sacrifice of Jesus meant that horrible things happened to him. Sometimes when we think of those horrible things that happened to Jesus, we think of the spitting and we think of the whipping we think of how he was beaten. We think of his crucifixion, those nails through his hands and his feet. And all of those things were horrible. But the worst of what happened to Jesus was when, while he was on the cross, he was punished for your sins. And he was punished for your sins because he was punished for the sins of the world. All of that fell on Jesus. God did this to demonstrate his justice. Since in his divine restraint, he had left the sins that were committed earlier unpunished. He did this to demonstrate his justice at the present time so that he would be both just and the one who justifies the person who has faith in Jesus. What happens to boasting then? It has been eliminated. By what principle? By the principle of works? No. But by the principle of faith. For we conclude that a person is justified by faith without the works of the law. What could happen, actually, to be more accurate to say, what should happen, is that any time anyone sins, he's not only dead right away, but he immediately goes to hell. That's the wages of sin. Not just physical death, but eternal death. The fact that that does not happen is clear because, well, look around you. Where are all those other people, some of whom you know full well, have sinned against you? The fact that that does not happen is demonstrated by the fact that, well, you're still here. 
You see, God is so patient. God is so loving. God is so gracious. He so earnestly desires the salvation of everyone that it seems as though, it looks as though, he's just ignored sin from the past. But he hasn't. God never leaves sin unpunished. But what he says is, I will not. I love you and I want you with me forever in heaven and his perfect justice is satisfied and your sins have been covered and God looks at you and sees one who is not guilty all because of Jesus. Now, I suppose that I could have told you some really funny stories today and maybe made you really laugh real hard. But you do have to leave here and go back out into the world. And you can leave with something better in your memory than a funny story about two golfers. You can leave here knowing the depth of God's love for you and how he used the power that is his to forgive your sins and to give you everlasting life. You can leave knowing that God declares you not guilty. It's all because of his grace and by Jesus' sacrifice. He is just and he loves you. And he's waiting to take you home to be with him. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. We confess our faith and our powerful and saving God using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in the response of prayer of the church. Lord God, our maker and preserver, we praise and thank you for all that you give us day after day. You have given us your precious word to nourish our souls and to protect us from the temptations of the devil, the world, and our sinful nature.
Heavenly Father, we pray that you shield us from every kind of danger, sudden catastrophe, terrors of crime, and the pain of disease. Watch over those who travel by land, sea, and air. Keep our loved ones from whatever perils may threaten them. Bless our land, our people, and those who hold offices of high trust. Keep our government and schools upright and strong for the advancement of good citizenship and useful vocations, that we may enjoy your gifts of peace, security, and well-being. Lord, as we bring you our private petitions. We bring these requests before you in the name of Jesus our Lord and ask you to hear us. Take all that we have, our bodies and minds, our time and skills, our ministries and offerings, and use them to your glory. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Please be seated for our next hymn, hymn number 380, Lord, tis not that I did choose you.
Please stand for prayer. <clears throat> oh Lord God, our Heavenly Father, pour out the Holy Spirit on your faithful people. Keep us strong in your grace and truth. Protect and comfort us in all temptation. And bestow on us your saving peace through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Brothers and sisters, go in peace, live in harmony with one another, serve each other with gladness. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord look on you with favor and give you peace. Good to be with you this morning. Pastor Steinke left me a number of announcements to read for you. Uh, there are a couple of garage sale signs in the narthex. If you could take one and stick it in your yard to promote our sale this coming Saturday in your neighborhood, I would be grateful. Also, another sorting and pricing day is planned for Thursday the 9th at 10 a.m. If you have time, please come out and help finish the prep for Saturday. Garage sale shift sign-up continues. Please look at the open slots on the orange sheets. Even if you have only an hour to spare, we could use your help. If you have a Mount Olive shirt or other Mount Olive gear, please wear it. Mount Olive Mary and Martha Society has their first meeting after the summer break on Wednesday. That'll be from 12.30 to 2 p.m. All women 18 and older are invited. Sign up for another church barbecue on Thursday, September 16th. That'll be from 5.30 to 7.30. That's on the bulletin board. 
a dish to pass is optional. And finally, please note in your service folder, Pastor Panko's 25th anniversary in the ministry and the worship service and picnic being planned for next Sunday at Roosevelt Park, 11 a.m. Invitation to the congregation is on the bulletin board. Pastor Panko knows what's going on next Sunday, but then again, he doesn't know all that's going on next Sunday. God bless your reading.